Okay, I think we'll make a start. Uh, well, hello everyone, I'm Stephen Matlin, and I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar on the subject of the need for integration of migration health aspects in the education of health professionals. This webinar is the seventh in a series of expert meetings on migration and refugee health that have been organized as virtual events this year by the World Health Summit M8 Alliance. The coordinator of this series is Professor Luciano Sasso, and he's based at Sapienza University in Rome. He's a member of the executive committee of the M8 Alliance of Academic Health Centers, Universities and National Academies. And he's also um, currently president of the Unica Network of Universities from the Capitals of Europe, which is our partner for today's webinar. Uh, Luciano has unfortunately been detained a little today in another meeting, but he's hoping to join us very shortly and we'll say a few words later on. So I'd like to start by uh, making a few introductory remarks about today's topic and in particular to reflect a little on the question, why do we need to discuss the integration of health aspects related to migration in the education of health professionals? And I think there are at least three major reasons for this. First, the health of migrants and refugees may be adversely affected by their circumstances that they've encountered along the entire pathway of their journeys, beginning with conditions and events that they've experienced at their point of origin, then at different points along their route and at their destination. These may have had physical or mental impact for which they require help and which may have been further exacerbated by delays in seeking or receiving that help. The nature and extent of the help that they need from health professionals may be qualitatively or quantitatively different from what is usually covered by routine training for dealing with the general population. And education can help to prepare health professionals to recognize and to be able to respond effectively to such health issues. Secondly, there are many factors that contribute to determining health including but extending far beyond the physical and biological injuries and diseases that present themselves in the clinic or hospital. From the broad definition of health in the 1948 World Health Organization Constitution, through milestones such as the 1978 Alma Declaration, the 1986 Ottawa Charter, the 1994 Human Development Report, the Health in All Policies movement begun in 2006, and the 2008 report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. With increasing clarity over the last several decades, there's been recognition of a growing list of economic, environmental, political, social, and other determinants of health. This has included an increasing awareness that health and well being are powerfully influenced by factors such as the attitudes and behaviors of the health system and the people who work in it. And as groups who are often excluded, marginalized, or endure different forms of legal, social, and cultural discrimination, migrants and refugees uh, often experience adverse impacts from the negative sides of these determinants. And education can help to prepare health professionals to recognize and try to counter them. Third, of course, this wider set of determinants is crucial to the health and well-being of all people, not just migrants and refugees. Following the first of these virtual expert meetings on migrant and refugee health at the beginning of this year, which was on the topic of the impact of COVID-19 on migrant and refugee health, we published a paper in eClinical Health in which we noted how the COVID-19 pandemic had stress tested all sectors and spheres, including health, exposing countless weaknesses and fault lines. And we pointed out that the health of migrants and refugees serves as an indicator system, like the canary in the cage of the old mining operations, with their degree of protection from pandemics, providing a litmus test for the competence of the global system of pandemic preparedness and health security. Today, we will see how this same perspective operates in a wider arena, the extent to which the education of health professionals equips them to be competent in responding to the health needs of migrants and refugees can be seen as an indicator, a litmus test of competence to respond to the diversity of health needs by all sections of society, regardless of their migration status. 
It's also important to emphasize that this competence, which includes the cultural competence that we're going to hear a lot about today, is not simply a matter of rounding out the overall education of health professionals with an extra layer. It's actually about ensuring that the entire health system and all the people who work in it are actively protecting and enabling the human right of all people, the right to health. Our first presentation today by Martin McKee from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine helps to place the education of health professionals to respond to the health needs of migrants and refugees in this wider context of health determinants. Now, unfortunately, Martin has very recently had a bereavement in his family, which meant that he's currently traveling and was unable to be with us in person today. However, I'm extremely grateful to Martin because at very short notice and short time frame, he very kindly agreed to record his talk as a video, which I just received yesterday. I asked Martin to speak for a little longer than the 10 minutes allotted to the other speakers, since he won't be available today to take part in the discussion responses to questions after the presentations are finished. So I'll now uh, try to screen share and find his presentation for you. And please let me know straight away if you don't hear the sound when I put. Thanks for inviting me to contribute to this webinar on the incorporation of migration into the training of health professionals. I'm going to be saying something about my experience of trying to do this at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in a public health course that I run. You'll see from my title that I've also included ethnicity because there are substantial overlaps between ethnicity and migration when we come to some of the key issues. You can see that in this newspaper headline and in this Swiss election poster. The common theme is that often people who are migrants or people who are ethnic minorities are considered as others. They are them rather than us. And as a consequence, they're often excluded or discriminated against in many of the policies that are important for public health. So this is how I organize my course. I start off with some discussion of the history of public health, looking at the concepts and the principles. Then I say something about describing the health of a population. And then I look at a series of determinants of health, social determinants, I say a bit about scientific determinants and clinical medicine physiology as well, commercial determinants, political determinants, I look at planetary health and healthcare as a de determinant of population health. And as we'll see, we can actually bring issues around migration and ethnicity into almost all of these. And then we talk about communicating health and we have some practical examples. The determinants of health are important. So here we have the biological mechanisms, the social determinants, the role of corporations, an increasingly important contributor to the health of populations, the political determinants. And then, of course, all of these take place within the concept of planetary health and healthcare cuts across all of these because it contributes to the health of the population as well. We talk about communicating health because this is where people get their information from, from the internet or from the tabloid newspapers. And uh, this is a particularly uh, interesting example from the UK media of all of the things that are meant to have an impact on dementia. My colleague Ben Goldacre has a, a website um, which is dedicated to the Daily Mail, one of our papers, in which he lists all of the stories um, which show that essentially everything in the world has been considered either a cause of or a cure for cancer. So communicating health and the way we frame issues is hugely important. So let's start off with the concepts of public health. And here the issue for us, I think, is whether the public health professional, the epidemiologist, should, as Ken Rothman has suggested, leave their values in the laboratory. Or should they, like Ruth Benita and Robert Beaglehall have, have suggested, be advocates? Uh, they say that unfortunately for many epidemiologists, the study of social factors is considered too political. But it is necessary, they argue, for epidemiology to affirm its connection with policy and to reject scientific isolation. 
and arguably we've seen that as being critically important in explaining the performance of different countries during the pandemic. I take an explicitly Marxist perspective uh, in this respect, if not in any other one, and I don't apologize for that. Marx famously said that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And I think that if you are a public health professional, you have a duty to contribute to making the world a better place, to making the invisible visible, making the invisible people who include many undocumented migrants visible, making their health problems visible, and then doing something about it. Some may disagree, but that's my starting point. But also when we talk about the concepts of public health, we need to remember that we have a dark side. It hasn't always been that we've been on the side of the angels. And in particular, in the 1930s, many schools of public health had departments of racial hygiene. Public health professionals played a key role in the Holocaust, for example. Just one of the quotations um, from one of the, the Nazi um, guidance at the, at the time. Uh, we also know that in Poland, for example, public health professionals played a key role in selecting people and uh, in doing experiments on the, the victims in the camps. So we always need to remember that there is a danger that those of us, particularly if we work in government, can be, uh, can be hijacked in many ways to pursue policies that are inimical to the rights of migrants and to ethnic minorities, a cautionary tale. My second lecture looks at describing the health of the population. And here a critical issue is whether we have data on migration status or ethnicity or in some cases religion. And of course, many countries either ban its collection or simply don't collect it. Now, there are good reasons for this. There are well-founded fears of abuse in Europe, particularly stemming from events in the 1930s. But I would argue that if the characteristics that cause people to be disadvantaged, like their migration status or like their ethnicity, are invisible in the data, how can we ever tackle them? I think this is going to be a crucial issue going forward, particularly as we see that minority ethnic populations and migrants suffered so much more during the pandemic. And yet in many countries that was effectively unseen. So what I talk about in my lecture, who is included in censuses in mortality data, what is the basis of inclusion? Is it residence or is it citizenship? We talk about concepts of citizenship. Is it the law of the blood? Is it the law of the soil? Do you get citizenship through your parents or being born in somewhere? And of course, there are increasingly the use of combinations here. And this is critical because in some countries in Europe, you can have been uh, the, there for several generations, but you still do may not actually have access to citizenship. And we need to recognize that the data often exclude people, cross-border workers and so on, seasonal workers, nomadic populations, but also migrants, people who are settled but denied documents, and refugees and asylum seekers, which is what we'll be talking a lot about in this webinar. So we need to be clear who is in and who is out of the data. And then we come to the issue of counting migrants. If we're, how do we count people who are not living in homes, who are not there when the census enumerators come? So we have to talk about that. And of course, there is a traditional way, which is to take a refugee camp, for example, a settlement, divide it into quadrants and sample the people there, multiply it up to give the total. But of course, that can only be done so, in, in so many times. So we talk about the new methods of doing this, particularly using satellite imaging and particularly the use of artificial intelligence for doing this, recognizing that it's sometimes easier to do this if migrants and refugees, displaced people are in a desert, more difficult if they're living under trees. So we look at the challenges that are involved in doing this. But by the, we then move on to the social determinants of health in particular migration status and ethnicity. Now, these are a selection of papers from one of the later speakers in the webinar, my colleague, Alan Krasnick, who has demonstrated very clearly how migrants in particular are often disadvantaged, but in different ways in terms of health. So we really need to understand this. 
But of course, one of the key reasons why they're disadvantaged is racism. And I think we now need to place racism very firmly at the center of our consideration of the social determinants of health. There are a number of ways of examining this, and I think this is a particularly elegant study looking in the United States where it was possible to define the racism in a particular area by the proportion of Google searches that contained the N-word, a uh, pejorative word for African-Americans. And they showed that that figure was significantly associated with not only the all-cause black mortality rate, but also black-white disparities in mortality. We need more work like this. We talk about the commercial determinants. I won't say much here, but we need to recognize that corporations have used ethnic divisions and differences in their marketing of products. And in particular, when we look in the United States, we can see how the tobacco industry has targeted ethnic minorities, particularly with menthol cigarettes, which account for the vast majority of cigarettes smoked by the African-American population. So this is another form of racism. And now we come on to the political determinants, which I think is exceptionally important. My hero is Rudolf Virchow a German pathologist from the 19th century who said that medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. He famously investigated an outbreak of typhus in Silesia and he concluded that the reason was not the louse spreading the typhus, I mean that was clearly a factor, but it was the upstream determinants, in particular the social stratification, the power of the aristocracy and that, the po that power being uh, supported by the church. So he called for universal democracy and for the uh, abolition of the church, addressing the political determinants of health. Now, we also know that politics is important from the recent experience of the pandemic. If it was just about technical capacity, then the countries that would have done best in the pandemic would be the United States, as measured on this Global Health Security Index, which looked at preparedness, published in 2019, and the United Kingdom, which came second. And these are not surprising. They're both countries with a huge amount of research capacity, strong public health services. But of course, it wasn't the technical capacity that was important. It was the politics and the fact that these countries were led by these two individuals, Donald Trump proposing that in some way you might shine uh, ultraviolet light inside people's bodies or disinfectant in their lungs. Uh, and Boris Johnson talking about taking the pandemic on the chin, letting it go through the uh, population. And um, not unsurprisingly, we have seen the consequences in terms of cases, in terms of deaths from COVID. Now, of course, there will be some people who say that health should keep out of politics, but the two are intrinsically associated. And there's now a growing body of work showing that it is worsening health that is a driver of populist politics. Here's an example from the United States. It was the factor most closely correlated with shifts in votes from the Democrats to Donald Trump. And of course, that means that that is then creating the fertile ground for racism, for xenophobia, for anti-migrant sentiment, and so on. So health is a, and deteriorating health is a driving force in many of the political attitudes we're seeing. We showed something similar in the United Kingdom or England and Wales. And of course, remember that many people voted for Brexit because they felt that it would exclude the foreign workers who they thought were coming in and taking their jobs. Politics and health are also related because democracy is good for health. Lots of evidence on how countries becoming democratic, low and middle income countries, uh, this is associated with a fall in child mortality, other work by Franco and colleagues in the BMJ showing how uh, the health outcomes on a whole range of measures are better in countries that are more democratic. But, and the but is work we did showing in a global analysis, increasing democracy, as others have found, does improve child mortality, except in poor, highly ethnically fragmented countries where it made it worse. And in countries where you had autocratic leaders that were holding the country together, 
where there was a lot of ethnic fragmentation, then when those leaders were displaced, then often the democratic process led to one group exerting power over another. And we've seen that very clearly in countries like Iraq and uh, to some extent, perhaps in Syria as well uh, in, in recent years. And there's a good reason for this. And this is work from Alberto Alessina. A lot of work that was done looking at how ethnic, linguistic and religious uh, divisions were often associated with poorer health and development policies. And the reason is that entrenched elites are unwilling to spend money that will benefit the others. Now, the others may be the poor, but they are particularly those people who look different, those people who are identifiably different. They're wearing different clothes. They have a different color of skin. A lot of this work was done in the United States, although um, Alessina also did the work internationally, and we've replicated it to some extent in Europe and found similar findings. Now, of course, we all know that there is um, health in all policies. This is the British cabinet, and you can see how many of them are responsible for areas that have an impact on health. And we can see a, a few examples that are directly relevant to uh, the uh, issue of migration and migrants and ethnic minorities. This was a study that looked at the, the Dreamers legislation. This was where children had come to the United States um, with undocumented migrant parents, and the program allowed them to have temporary work permits and freed them from the threat of deportation. And this was a study that identified people who were potentially element, uh, eligible for the Dreamers uh, intervention. And it showed that once that policy was brought in, there was a significant reduction in their psychological distress. Security is really important for many migrant communities who have faced incredible insecurity. Another study from the United States, Jacob Bohr's work, and this, to cut a long story short, um, shows that the mental health of African Americans um, deteriorates in states um, that have had the shooting of an unarmed black American in the three months prior to participating in a, natural, uh, a national survey. There was no impact among white um, respondents, and this was only found when the police killed unarmed black Americans, not unarmed white Americans or armed black Americans. So you can see how for ethnic minorities, migrant populations, often they're living in a state of deep insecurity because they experience racism, because they experience prejudice, and these are ways in which we can measure it. I don't have, I'm running out of time, so I'll just say very briefly that we need to look at the way in which health is communicated. In the United Kingdom, we have extensive racism uh, and discrimination in many areas of public life. And it's hardly surprising when you see the way that migrants are portrayed in the media. So I hope that that has illustrated the ways in which we can incorporate some of the issues around migration and ethnicity in our public health training. It's a very brief overview, but I hope it's given you some ideas. And thank you very much indeed. Thanks for inviting me to contribute to this webinar on the incorporation of migration into the training. Okay, um, well, my thanks again to Martin for taking the time and trouble to record his presentation for us. Um, we'll move on straight away to our second speaker today, who is uh, Rena Papadopoulos. Uh, she's from Middlesex University in London, and she's been researching issues relating to transcultural health and cult cultural competence for over 30 years. And she is the originator of work that led to development of a model of transcultural nursing and cultural competence. Much of her research has been focused on migrant and refugee health and well-being. So, Rena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try and do this first. preview. Okay, well, thank you very much um, uh, for inviting me to speak to this webinar. 
Um, as, uh, uh, as Stephen has mentioned, my name is Irena Papadopoulos and I am a trans uh, professor for transcultural health and nursing at Middlesex University. And my contribution today is really a, a very, very brief uh, um, a discussion around cultural competence for um, students, uh, uh, healthcare students, and in relation to um, the topic of refugees and migrants. So I only have 10 minutes. I probably will use a couple of more minutes, but uh, um, the uh, uh, cultural uh, aspects, as, as the previous speaker um, has uh, said, actually it was a very, very informative and, and ex excellent uh, presentation. Uh, and it links to uh, all the things that I, I haven't got time to say, but cultural um, aspects uh, influence uh, our, our health and our behaviors. Um, so there have been topic, uh, topics of, of interest for many decades by all sorts of uh, scientists as uh, listed there. So we, um, uh, cultural competence uh, it looks at uh, the element of uh, the impact of culture on uh, our health, our illness, uh, the way that we look after ourselves, the way that we want to be looked after by um, health professionals and so on. But it is more than just culture. So um, I'm just going to make the statement straight away that uh, I believe that health professionals cannot call themselves culturally competent unless they uh, promote health uh, rights, uh, challenge racism in all, form, in all forms of oppression and discrimination. They advocate for their patients and the people that they work with and they address inequalities. And of course, this is the issue about, poly, uh, you know, uh, uh, we want we shy away from politics, and I think it was really nice that the previous speaker um, actually focused and explained that the importance of that. So um, I'm going to introduce you to the Papadopoulos Tilke and Taylor model of cultural competence, which is a model that I and two colleagues developed in the early 1990s. It is underpinned by human rights, human ethics, caring, socio-political, there you are, uh, systems, intercultural relations and culturally competent education. Uh, let me remind you, I probably you don't need to be, to be reminded, but I will do that. The first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and right, and they're endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another with the spirit of brotherhood. Uh, the question is, are they? Are they free and equal? And do they behave in a, in, you know, in a humane way to each other? So if we look at this uh, slide, um, there's a lot of pain there. Um, the, uh, the, the UNHCR um, stated that in 2020, there were 82, nearly 82.5 million individuals who were forcibly displayed um, because of persecution, conflict, violence, and human rights violations. And you can see how that breaks down. So there's nearly 26 and a half million refugees 48 million inter internally displayed, uh, displaced people, uh, 4.1 million asylum seekers, and nearly 4 million Venezuelans uh, displaced abroad. So what does the, the pictures tell us? And, you know, pain, there's painfully um, uh, kind of uh, present uh, them, uh, in, uh, those people. Um, that are in the pictures. Well, for me, they represent failures. Failures before uh, and during displacement, probably failures. Uh, there, were, there are lots of failures after people, um, during people's uh, travels and, and, um, and being um, uh, accepted by host countries. And in my view, uh, again, it relates to a lot of the things that the previous uh, speaker um, mentioned. Uh, these failures are about uh, power. 
uh, politics, greed, racism, oppression, and so forth. So the opposite is really of all the things that the uh, uh, Declaration of Human Rights says. So for that reason, I think we need to be um, uh, um, preparing uh, healthcare students to um, in culturally competent uh, ways, uh, because not only will they, they become good uh, global citizens, uh, all, uh, also they will adopt, hopefully, the virtues of compassion, courage, genuine friendship, forgiveness, etc., according to Aristotle, I suppose. Um, so that my definition of cultural competence is, uh, the, is that it is a process that we go through in order to continuously develop and refine our capacity to provide effective and compassionate health care, taking into consideration people's cultural beliefs, behaviors, and needs. It involves four key uh, constructs, uh, cultural competence, uh, knowledge, sensitivity, and competence. So where are we in terms of using culturally competent approach to uh, train uh, the, the students, um, especially uh, these days with all the, all the uh, asylum seekers and refugees and the topic that we're talking about today. So in very briefly, um, there is a large and growing body of literature reporting the benefits of cultural competent approach, and I'm not going to go into those. Um, uh, as, uh, you can Google it and find all sorts of research that has been done. Um, and some progress has been achieved in adopting cultural competence approach in education. But in my view, it is sporadic and is not uh, systematic. So currently there is um, an absence of agreed national standards for cultural competence cultural competent training, education and practice for undergraduate students is not uh, compulsory and it varies by institution. Lecturers and clinical instructors have no specific cultural competence preparation. And in terms of the migrants and refugee education programs, there is no specific course requirement um, for uh, especially, well, the, um, the postgraduate is more of a, a different uh, a situation than the undergraduate. So there, I'm going to just very quickly show you three slides of uh, national and international um, regulators and uh, of education and uh, of professions. Uh, this one is from the International Council of Nurses. This one is the code of professional standards from the Nursing and Midwifery Council in the UK. And the last one is from uh, um, training the general practitioners. Uh, this is a very comprehensive list of training guides. But um, if you look at all of these documents, which are very nice and, and very uh, presented nicely, and they have very positive statements and whatever, you will find, and it is not just in Europe, I think everywhere, there is nothing specific or obligatory about cultural competence, which really is about time that something is done about it. Um, there is a need for undergraduate and postgraduate healthcare curricula to, 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 to approach cultural competence in a more systematic way of learning. Uh, not just because some teacher is interested or something happened and you're, you're um, uh, kind of like um, put on something quickly uh, to respond to that. So this is the model that I developed, as I said, um, about 30 years ago. Um, it is used across the world for um, creating, from those people who want to uh, include a, a systematic approach to cultural competence. And you can see the, the four constructs that I mentioned, but and underneath each one, there is a map of um, sub constructs that would uh, suggest the, the kinds of things that one needs to include in the curriculum. So for example, looking at the um, uh, taking the, as, uh, the case of the uh, Afghan refugees, uh, the most recent uh, group of people, uh, what would, how, 
uh, how do we address the cultural awareness uh, co uh, component? We need to um, obviously uh, uh, start by looking at our own values and attitudes about these people. We uh, need to learn more about their culture, religion, heritage, and ethnic history. It is not for granted that people will know and our students, whatever age they are, need to engage with this uh, body of knowledge. And how can I, you know, how, how do we um, enable them to address the stereotypes, to reflect on the stereotypes that we all have stereotypes about people um, so that they can move on with more open, open uh, minds. So in terms of uh, cultural knowledge, we need to uh, learn more about the health beliefs, the uh, health behaviors, illness behaviors. We need to understand their common health uh, problems and specific uh, uh, diseases or health problems they may have. Um, we need to understand the socio-political systems and the healthcare systems and other institutes that they come from, because if they they used to this. Now they're in in our country. They need to learn, uh, you know, the way that uh, we provide healthcare, or and so forth. So it's a different uh, difference there. Also, uh, of course, we need to address the health inequalities. And the previous speaker talked a lot about what causes these health inequalities, which was very important to hear. Um, cultural sensitivity is all about developing um, uh, human relationships and without human, uh, good human relationships, trustworthy, appropriate relationships, we, you cannot move anywhere. And of course, um, uh, learning, uh, uh, not necessarily a new language, but addressing the issue of verbal and nonverbal uh, uh, communication is also very important. So in, um, uh, putting all those three uh, uh, constructs into practice is the culture competent element, which is in this case, we need to think about how do we uh, adjust the assessment of health needs for these uh, refugees? How do we uh, adjust our clinical skills so that we can provide uh, culturally sensitive, appropriate, acceptable care? And of course, um, uh, we need to um, show that we, uh, if we identify any, uh, dis any discrimination or any racism that we have to address it. So these are three examples of recent work that I have done. Um, and uh, the first one is uh, the N6 pro uh, project is about providing uh, culturally competent psychological support to newly arrived refugees. In that case, it was in, in Greece and Turkey. Um, the other one is about uh, older people and the, and the N8 is about um, enabling the health providers to understand and to be able to help the refugee parents with uh, adjusting their parenting skills as they move, as they move across countries and, and live in temporary um, uh, camps. Um, this is the, um, an, an, exa the, an example of the parenting study that we did. And this is how the, um, the knowledge map was adapted for this particular group of people. And, the group, and, and it shows the various, we developed a number of learning units which we delivered in a, in a program for education of uh, people who work with refugees. Um, in terms of policy, um, it's not just about um, teaching people to be um, uh, to individual health professionals and students to become culturally competent. That is very, very important, but we have to have organizations that are culturally competent that, and they support and work environments that support those kind of values and, and ways of doing, uh, of delivering, uh, learning and delivering care for refugees and asylum seekers and, and, or, uh, and displaced people. We need uh, culturally competent and compassionate leaders. We need to train uh, the educators and the practice mentors. We need to develop, uh, to create uh, cultural competence standards um, and uh, in partnership with all the different 
uh, stakeholders, uh, which and would not just pr uh, just pr uh, uh, prepare them, but regular uh, uh, apply them and regularly monitor and evaluate them. Uh, obviously, research. Uh, I don't need to say any more. But also, I believe that we need to have the time has come for the creation of a, of a cultural competence accreditation body, so that all organisations um, need to go through that. Um, uh, you know, to to achieve the 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 the, uh, the symbol that may <laughs> to uh, will say that they are uh, or not culturally competent organization or health provider. Um, and I suggest, of course, my little flower that you have seen in my slides with a with a little logo at the bottom that says cultural competence better care for all. There's some um, um, uh, references. And thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry about the speed of it, but <laughs> couldn't help it. Thank you. Shall I stop it? Uh, thank you, Rena. If you could stop the screen share now, then yeah. we'll move on. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Rena. And I, I'm sure we'll want to come back to a number of the points you've made in the discussion. Uh, but I'm going to now move straight on to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Michael Nipper. And he's at the Institute for the History of Medicine in Justus Liebig University in Gießen, Germany. Michael brings a historically and anthropologically grounded perspective to his research and teaching on determinants of health, with a particular focus on intercultural health, internationalization, and migrant health. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you for this invitation, first of all. And it's really a pleasure to be with this distinguished group of people sharing ideas about education in this field of migrant health. I will share now my presentation. I hope you all can see this. And uh, keep going. Um, so it's really a pleasure. And what I want to do in this 10 minutes is to share some basic ideas about how I learned to organize my teaching, the content and the didactics uh, on migration and health and in med medical education. And first of all, I will share some very basic assumptions that really guide my teaching all the time, and then introduce what I find essential perspectives for this teaching, which is history, actually, anthropology and human rights, which already relates to some of the uh, issues that have been mentioned before. And then some very brief conclusions uh, regarding the operationalization of this theoretical and ethical issues in medical education, because it's easy to talk about, we have to include social, ethical, historical, anthropological dimensions into medical education, but how to do this in a way that it's meaningful for medical students who are really used to have a very different type of training. And um, that's, I think, a critical point. And for me, the, the point of the um, basic assumptions is one that is inspired by this uh, saying what was on the on the Lancet uh, Commission on Migration and Health that worldwide mobility is our future regardless of laws and wars. I think and wars for me it's really important to stress always in the introduction to the students and when I had the chance to talk about this issue that migration and human mobility is our past, present and future and it's part of our societies even though we are used at our structures, countries, health systems, laws, and so on, are created in a kind of a migration blind way, never considering migration in a comprehensive and coherent way, but only spotting here a little bit migration, there a little bit, but the general standard is thinking of immobile population, nation states. And that is one of the problem of the problems that I see. And, and we cannot prevent migration. We should prevent forced migration. We pre should prevent that people are forced to leave their countries but migration and mobility itself is not a problem. And that's the second point, uh, like William Lassie Swing said in 20, 2015, migration is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be managed. And uh, I think migration in our context is not a problem in itself and not necessarily healthy or unhealthy. It depends very much on the conditions. And there we are on the on the level of the determinants and Martin McKee introduced this very broadly and I think we'll speak about this 
Furthermore, uh, the health effects of migration are due to the multiple determinants that we know from the social, political, commercial, and I would also say legal determinants because the legal status of people is very important, very specific to migrants because only foreigners have a legal status which is kind of questioning their existence, their security, and so on. So that's, it's, that is for me very specific uh, determinant of migrant health, the legal status. Um, and we have all these multiple determinants that are interacting in very complex ways. And, and then the second point of this uh, quote from William Swing is that migration health has to be managed and in our field of health, it has to be managed at all levels to prevent avoidable harm for the individuals, but also for our societies that we have also already has been mentioned previously. And I think also when we talk about cultural competence trainings or cultural competence, for example, that's a course, the competencies are very important, but when we, not, when we aren't able to, to create institutions where cultural competence Cultural competent, uh, culturally competent care can really be realized, uh, it's really difficult. So we have to think about this management idea of this, uh, this at the end, political aspect uh, very seriously, I think. And at the end, I always start with the students to talk about migration and health is very complex, and that's too complex for easy responses to the question if migration is related to health or disease, or if migration is responsible to the disease problem or something like that. It's really complex and we have to go a little bit deeper. And for this, I like to work with the three dimensions of history, anthropology, and human rights for really try to understand what is happening regarding migration and health. And I think epidemiology, as we have seen in the quantitative analysis is very, very important, but I think the historical and anthropological perspective as well, and even the human rights perspective is also important for our analysis, I think. So what do I mean with history? I know that history of medicine is not such a very prominent feature in medical education and in the medical reasoning, even though I'm very, and for this particular reason also, I'm very grateful to Martin McKee that he introduced Rudolf Virchow, who is one of my historical hero heroes as well. So what do I mean with history? It's mainly the history of the present so that we think about that our present situation is defined by the history of the last weeks, years and decades. And the situation of the migrants we meet is all, also shaped by this recent history or even sometimes the larger history when we look about the conflicts in the Middle East, for example, that are creating large groups of forced migration. There's a history behind this. At the same time, Migration dynamics and determinants and narratives and so on, they change over time. It's a different of to talk about migration health today or five years ago or 10 years ago when I started teaching migration and health in 20, 2004. It was only about the, the former German uh, Turkish guest workers in Germany. That was a discourse on migration and health. Nobody talked about refugees at that time. And then it was undocumented people. And then now it's a refugee crisis at the, or the refugee issue. And at the moment, migration is only understood in case of refugees, but we overlook large part of the migration communities. And we also always have to tell the full story behind what we observe regarding the inequities, for example, the patterns at risk. When we talk now in Germany about the, the the high number of migrants in the intensive care units and hospitals due to COVID-19, it's epidemi epidemiological data. Yes, but there is a story behind and there's a social and a structural story behind that is related to the German immigration politics of the last decades. And to really understand migration and health, we have to think about these stories and also for our responses. Then the anthropological dimension. Uh, all these stories and these realities and the, the living of the people and so on, the suffering happens in a place. And for me, anthropology is first of all, a perspective that enables to understand what is happening in local context. There's this lovely word of slow research where you are sitting there with the people, you are knowing the context, talk to the people, know the structures and the inequities and so on, because they all have a place. We have to understand the place to understand what is happening and also how to organize the response. For example, with local stakeholders, with local NGOs, with local knowledge about the communities and so on. And all this combined actually with mobility and, and the transnational social spaces, uh, which are the spaces where, the mi where many migrants often live, which are unknown by the modern migrant society, by the host community. 
And then we have the issue of culture. The previous talk was about this and cultural competence. And I think culture has many different meanings in relation to migration and health. And I will not only focus on the culture of the others, but also look of our ways or of the culture in our institutions, for example. Uh, and I have the observation and the, the, the impression that we have the, that we create different cultural spaces according, for example, to legal status or the, to the legal uh, framework. When we have a, a, a refugee camp in Germany, for example, the way of doing medicine there is very different than, than outside the camp and the, the values and the possibility to discriminate, for example, people is much more, is very different than outside. So you have a kind of a culture, even of a culture of discrimination in certain contexts when we deal with, with uh, migration and health and we have to uh, address this. And then the anthropological approach behind culture also enables us to understand how the determinants actually play out in a specific place and how they interact connectively or syn synergy and, and synergy often to, to worsen even the situation of those who are most behind. And in direct contrast to this, on opposition to this, is the human rights framework and also for our analysis of migration and health. I think when we use simply the principles of human rights, of non-discrimination and what we all talked so much about to leave no one behind, that can guide our sensitivity for inequities and for every med student, for every physician, for every health professional or politician or whatsoever, guided by the principle of non-discrimination and to leave no one behind helps to identify where are the problems, where are the groups who are furthest behind, where do we have to start with our actions. And then the human rights instruments from international law offer very important instruments to us. The, the notion of the underlying determinants of health is really a complement to the social determinants of health perspective from public health. The AAAQ framework for non-discriminating health services is a very practical tool for improving our services and we can take it and start today when we want to improve something and that's a very practical way of talking with our students about what can we do because the students don't only want to discuss and analyze they want to act and they want to feel encouraged and empowered for action and I think human rights offers a lot of instrument and practical ways and at the end a very important message that is always important in the discussion with the student that we can start by addressing the most obvious inequities. We will not achieve the ideal world of justice and we will not solve all the problems, but we can start with addressing the most obvious inequities and we created a service learning project where students accompany patients with tuberculosis, migrants and not migrants, and there they learn really to support one patient and guide him through the German system. And there they really learn what obstacles, what barriers do exist. They learn what xenophobia and racism means in the current practice in their university city in these hospitals and, the, and, and so on. And so they support the patient at the same time they, they really expose themselves to the reality and they see that they can start realizing human rights and advancing human rights in their daily practice. And that's a very powerful learning experience for the students. And I will come to the conclusions now, some ideas for operationalizing these theoretical and ethical dimensions in medical education, which are based on history, anthropology, and human rights. I used to offer the students these kind of five questions. Well, in the course, we have more time to discuss. But the first question I always ask is, why do we talk about migrants in relation to health to help in a specific situation. We had currently the observation of this high number of migrants on the intensive care units. And why do we, and in what way do we start talking about migrants in this context? And what is our notion about migrants in this context? Is this anecdotal evidence only, or is it kind of systematic approach, approach that does not only look on the migrants, but on all the people and compares to others, and include all migrant groups, for example. The second question is what type of migration or migrant group are we talking about? And as I mentioned before, there are changing dynamics of migration, but also of public attention. Some people are in the focus of public attention, other are overlooked. And we, when we want to be systematic, we really have to try to reflect on our perspective on this. 
And then the third one, what do we expect to be the meaning of migration for health? Is it only that we see migrants, people we identify as migrants or we read as migrants, and then we think, oh, there's a relation to health? Or do we have a clear idea? And I think for each condition, for each disease, be it tuberculosis or mental health issue or whatsoever, there are specific determinants. It's the biosocial understanding, biopsychosocial understanding of disease. And we have to be specific. We have to be specific for each condition uh, or have a syndemic analysis where I have the comorbidities and the social context and so on for really explaining what it means, migration in the context of health. And then for what is the perspective of the people? We have to engage with the people also. And uh, what is the people's view on their situation, problem and priorities? I recently was in a meeting with migrant groups and the public health service about COVID-19 vaccinations and the public health people were convinced that they have to work in convincing the people of getting vaccine, that they have to go to, to, to inform people and so on. And that they are they supposed to find a kind of reluctance among the migrant groups regarding vaccines. And then when finally the migrants could talk in this meeting, they said, what are you waiting for? We are waiting for you. We want the vaccine, but where can we get it? How can we organize and so on? They were really ready for it and waiting for it, but the public health department, before talking to the people, they assume that there will be problems, especially they assume that there will be cultural problems. And, and that's really a problem. We really have to talk to the people or listen to the people. And, and then the final point is what can be done to advance health equity for all? We can do this in clinical context with structural adaptations for interpreters, cultural mediation. And we have here a very good experience this cultural supervision that we meet with health staff and to talk about cases, about patients, and reflect on this. Is really cultural or structural issue or other issues are relevant for a problem people uh, perceive, for example, in the clinical context. And we have to think about the community level and there these service learning uh, approaches can be very helpful and very instructive. And we have to think about changes on the political level. And I, for me, at the end, migration health is always a very political issue because of the political and the legal determinants of health, which create this context and where we are working on this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Michael. And um, our next speaker is also going to bring uh, an anthropologist's view to our discussions, uh, Denise Spitzer who is a medical anthropologist in the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta in Canada, is also an adjunct professor in the Institute of Feminist and Gender Studies at the University of Ottawa. Her work examines how global processes mediated through intersectionality are implicated in health and well-being, including from immigrants, migrants and refugees in different parts of the world. Denise, the floor is yours. and you're muted at the moment. Schönen guten Tag, bonjour. And uh, as I try to get my uh, slides in order, I'll also uh, have to apologize to the Hungarian colleagues. My, my uh, uh, Hungarian grandfather only taught me how to say good evening and I'd probably mangle it this time. So I'll skip to uh, good morning from uh, uh, from the Americas uh, for myself and the other colleagues who are uh, hopefully uh, participating from that part of the world. In fact, I'm speaking to you from Ottawa, which is uh, on unceded Algonquin territory in Canada. We are uh, like to acknowledge the fact that we are primarily a migrant country um, that was formed through settler colonialism. And uh, as we wrangle with the, uh, the the complications and the consequences of those acts, which of course continue through today. So again, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this webinar and, and uh, look forward to our discussions. And I should say, uh, I'm really thrilled to be on a panel with other medical anthropologists and uh, to, uh, and I'm speaking to you probably as an outsider to, in fact, medical education. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, that does never stops uh, scholars from commenting on these things. So 
without further ado, hopefully I will, good. So over 326 million people around worldwide can be classified as migrants, including immigrants, migrant workers, refugees, asylum seekers, undocumented workers, or internally displaced persons. The acquisition or the imposition of these labels by state actors in concert with agreements laid out in international conventions structures migrants' mobility um, across sites of departure, transit, and destination. And notably, as my, the, some of the previous panelists have alluded to, these categories into which migrants are situated really structures access to certain rights, programs, services, residences, and controls, in fact, their mobility. But migrant labels, of course, are not equitably distributed. There are gendered and racialized divisions of labor, which are strongly intertwined with migrant designations. Certainly in Canada, and I think as many countries in the global north, racialized migrants from the global south are more likely to be allocated to permanent migrant categories, uh, sorry, temporary migrant categories. Moreover, racialized migrant women disproportionately occupy the lowest echelons of the labor market, um, often experiencing doubt of mobility and de-skilling. And in essence, they're more likely to be associated with precarious labor, which due to their migrant status, often devolves into precarious lives. Importantly, migration and racialized status, gender, socioeconomic class, ethnicity, and other intersecting social markers contour access to determinants of health, including, of course, the uptake of healthcare services. Now, despite the often sort of dominant circulating uh, uh, perception that you know, migrants overburden or overrun local healthcare resources, migrants, in fact, for a host of reasons, generally, in fact, underutilize healthcare in many of our countries. And I'm generalizing broadly here when I'm speaking of biomedical education. But biomedical education often emphasizes, and I think with good reason, technological competence. I think most of us agree that when we see a physician, uh, we'd like to make sure that they know what they're doing. Um, but it also trains students to identify and treat disease, which is, is regarded as a kind of singular, identifiable and gen generalizable entity. And uh, this, this gaze uh, you know, provides a, a very kind of singular focus on, on uh, uh, this, this rather uh, con contained uh, pathogen and its sequelae. But focusing attention on the individual and perhaps approximate causes of a complaint has the potential to erase patients' life trajectories and the broader social context into which they are situated. And I think uh, Professor McKee articulated that uh, uh, well in his uh, video presentation. In recent decades, efforts to acknowledge patients' cultural influences have been incorporated into biomedical education through the promotion of cultural sensitivity and cultural competency, where healthcare providers gain an understanding of these dominant health beliefs and practices of their client base as a means of offering more effective migrant health care. We should, know, of course, note that, that these approaches are, again, not you know, homogeneous. And uh, as Professor Papadopoulos has, has indicated, uh, the approach she employs is, of course, one that is inclusive of, of social and broader context. But where it has not sort of taken these issues into consideration, it has often been critiqued for its tendency to fall back on and reinforce cultural stereotypes and for identifying culture as a decontextualized and singular barrier that needs to be breached in order to assimilate migrant patients into local biomedical systems. Furthermore, may fail to, to consider the diversity and idiosyncrasies of practices, values, beliefs, and lived experience, and the import of sociopolitical and individual contexts. So I'm thinking here of you know, some of the kind of cookbook uh, approaches that were, were used, uh, you know, maybe uh, hopefully discarded by now, but certainly they were omnipresent in Canadian hospitals 
uh, throughout the, the 80s and 90s and uh, early 20, uh, 21st century. And if you want to be amused, it's sometimes interesting to look up your particular ethnic group if you are um, uh, so lucky as to be included in some of these handbooks to see how in fact you are supposed to behave. Um, now, uh, in medical schools, in Canada at least, uh, there, are, there is some specific content on refugee and migrant health in the curriculum. And a recent study of medical school curriculum in Canada revealed that 20% spent 20, 10 to 20 hours on the topic over a course of a four-year degree program. 40% included five to 10 years throughout their programs and 40% in uh, less than five year, uh, year hours over a course of, again, the entire medical school um, curriculum. So the limited amount of time dedicated to issues specific to migrant health suggests that perhaps an adoption of a lens that might sensitize medical students to the broader context of patients' lives while allowing for the specificities of their experience diffused across their educational journeys might in fact be a greater import and impact then these few hours dedicated uh, of instruction across medical school careers. To this end, I call for the introduction and incorporation of an intersectional lens into medical training as a means of both responding to the call for reintroducing or introducing the social back into medicine and helping to promote migrant health equity. So this again refers once to Virchow's uh, comments that were made again, shared again in the, in the first video. So rooted in black, indigenous, queer and post-colonial feminisms, intersectionality refers to the mutually constituted and fluid constellation of interacting categories of social markers such as socioeconomic, racialized and migrant statuses, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, indigeneity, ability, geography, et cetera all of which are situated within historical, so colonial and neo-colonial and contemporary context, all of which again inform life, lived experience and which produce social location. Importantly, intersectionality does not automatically privilege a particular axis of difference. So it's not just gender, nor is it additive, so gender plus class plus race. Instead, it highlights the totality of these interacting categories, which is in fact how we are presented to and responded to in the world where we experience, depending upon context, varying degrees of both oppression and privilege. In essence, intersectionality allows us to unpack the tangled relationships amongst social structures and social location that underpin health disparities. Although specific discussion of migrant health, I believe is certainly still needed in medical school education and deserves to both be expanded in the classroom, but also in practicum um, settings as, as a previous uh, speaker alluded to, integrating an intersectional lens into all aspects of medical school education could ensure that migrant health is not relegated to this brief add-on in the curriculum. A focus on intersectionality enlivens the body, which bears the physical, sociopolitical, historical, and psychological assaults of individual and communal contexts and trajectories. Deploying an intersectional lens can help train physicians to offer more relevant care that attends to broader social context and can help to disrupt the reductionism of the biomedical model and the objectification of the medical gaze by consistently provoking questions about the historicity and structural context of biomedical knowledge and the presentation of patients' complaints. For example, Metzel and Hansen suggest that biomedical education should include what a quote, structural competency as a trained ability to discern how a host of issues defined clinically as symptoms, attitudes, or diseases also represent downstream implications, unquote. I think this would be an important step towards reframing the gaze of health practitioners to situate patients, including migrants, within their intersectional status by teasing out their individual stories and interrogating the structural matters that have shaped and continue to shape their well-being. So 
in, in, if I can just again bring out the, the key um, messages in this very brief um, uh, presentation, is that biomedical education in its focus on technical competence reinforces a reductionist approach in medical gaze that focuses on disease as an entity that behaves in a singular manner, generally absent from context. Specificities of migrant health are given certainly scant uh, attention, at least in the Canadian uh, medical school context. Intersectionality, which highlights the kinetic interactions amongst markers of social stratification, reinserts the social, political, personal, and historical context into which lives are lived and health issues are experienced and articulated. As a lens, intersectionality can be embedded throughout medical school curricula, which will still require, again, specific attention to migrant health, but which can contribute to more nuanced care for the entire patient population. And using tools such as structural competency can become a useful first step towards this goal. So thank you, merci beaucoup, Jimmy Quich. Thank you very much indeed, Denise. And um, we'll move on to our penultimate speaker now, who is um, Istvan Sillard. Istvan previously worked for many years with the International Organization for Migration, which gave him a very wide experience of migrant and refugee health needs. And in his current role as a professor and chief scientific advisor, at the University of Pécs Medical School in Hungary. He's involved with migration health education at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. So, uh, Isvan, um, give us your presentation, please. And we're not hearing you at the moment. I think you need to unmute. Uh, thank you, uh, Stefan, for this uh, kind of introduction uh, and uh, I may add uh, some other uh, not so much uh, personal but uh, university related issues. The question is why Pech University is uh, so highly engaged uh, in uh, migration health uh, uh, training for future uh, health professionals. Pech uh, is only 30 kilometers from uh, the former Yugoslavian border. Uh, and uh, during uh, the crazy uh, civil war in uh, former Yugoslavia, the first uh, migrants and refugees escaping uh, for this uh, bloody uh, territory uh, have arrived uh, to Pech. I personally, uh, because uh, my original profession uh, is uh, specialist in internal medicine, uh, was uh, on night service uh, because uh, the first uh, injured uh, refugees uh, from Yugoslavia uh, have arrived. Altogether, more than 300,000. Uh, Yugoslavian citizens uh, arrive uh, to Hungary. So that's uh, why uh, our university uh, was uh, sensitized uh, towards uh, migrant migration. Uh, and uh, the dean uh, of the uh, university have uh, recognized that uh, migration not only locally, uh, but globally, in the future, uh, will be a key issue. Uh, not speaking about uh, its health and public health impact. Uh, that's why, uh, in uh, 1997, he has invited me back from Brussels, uh, from the International Organization for Migration, with the task that uh, University of Page should deal in its uh, education uh, and research uh, work with migration. So that is uh, the uh, personal uh, and uh, background why uh, University of Page uh, is uh, engaged uh, so highly uh, in uh, migration health uh, training uh, and uh, research.
I was uh, very much uh, pleased uh, listening uh, to the previous uh, presentations, uh, especially uh, Irina uh, Papadopoulos uh, when speaking about uh, cultural competence uh, was uh, very much reaching and explaining a key issue. Then we are speaking about uh, that uh, future health professionals should be prepared to deal with the health, public health, mental health problems of migrants and cultural competence. As uh, she has explained, it is a key issue. With Alan, uh, we were participating uh, in a uh, project uh, called uh, Cultural Competence in the Medical Education, uh, where uh, the majority uh, of uh, medical uh, universities of uh, the European Union uh, was met checking how cultural competence is incorporated uh, in the training. This is uh, really uh, discouraging. So that is uh, when uh, at the international uh, forum, colleagues, when we are speaking about uh, whether proper health assistance is available uh, for migrants, I think proudly that uh, yes, uh, according uh, to our uh, legislation, uh, migrants have uh, right-based access to the health system. Okay, but the question is, to what kind of healthcare system? How healthcare systems are really prepared to provide the so-called migrant sensitive health assistance. WHO, during uh, the past decades, has mentioned repeatedly, even in resolutions, even uh, in uh, the assembly uh, accepted problems uh, that the European uh, Union, WHO member states has to develop, has to strengthen the so-called migrant sensitive health training and naturally has services. Following uh, the migration wave uh, of uh, 2015, in Rome, uh, WHO uh, was uh, having uh, an assembly with the participation uh, of uh, 50 member states, uh, also uh, WHO offices uh, from uh, Europe uh, and uh, Asia uh, were uh, invited uh, where again, there was a clear uh, understanding that Yes, healthcare systems should be prepared how to cope with the, all of challenges what migrant and immigrants mean. There was uh, in uh, 2016, a clear uh, decision of WHO 
European Assembly that migrant sensitive health system should be developed in the member states. I do not want uh, to go through uh, all of those uh, points uh, where uh, it is uh, mentioned uh, why and uh, what are the main uh, features uh, of this uh, system. Uh, but the question is that when WHO, European Center for Disease Prevention uh, and Control as well, uh, clearly called the attention uh, of uh, European uh, countries that the health system should be prepared how to face with this new challenge. The question is always, okay, but what about the human capacity? What about those health professionals, how they are prepared and trained for these new challenges? And uh, unfortunately, very badly, and uh, it is uh, not only an issue that, uh, yes, uh, these topics are not uh, really uh, present uh, in uh, the current uh, curricula uh, of the European uh, medical uh, schools, but uh, we have uh, found uh, a clear uh, picture about uh, that uh, even professionals of uh, those uh, humanitarian organizations who are uh, providing uh, assistance in refugee camps, in that case, uh, in uh, five countries of the Balkans, uh, with the International Federation of Red Cross and West uh, Christians uh, societies, uh, we have launched uh, a survey uh, past uh, year. And uh, within the frame of this survey, uh, we have uh, also checked uh, the preparedness, uh, the knowledge uh, and attitude uh, of uh, those uh, health professionals who in the camps, were assisting the migrant uh, population. That was a, a questionnaire survey uh, in uh, four uh, countries uh, of the back and uh, all together uh, uh, 100 uh, colleagues from Médecins Sans Frontier, Danish Refugee Council, International Organization for Migration, uh, IFRC, uh, and the local public health uh, authorities uh, participated uh, in this uh, questionnaire survey. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the responses uh, were showing again that currently, even those professionals who are providing has assistance for migrants are not really well prepared. For example, WHO and the ECDC migration health protocols were not known. Most of these colleagues have not participated in any migration health training. Unfortunately, a relative high number of them were showing weakness in infectology and the epidemiology. And many of them were complaining about their own cycle load practically 
they were uh, in a pre-phase of burnout uh, syndrome. Uh, I was uh, bringing uh, this data only just uh, to provide evidences that when we are speaking about that uh, all the uh, international organizations like uh, WHO, ECDC are calling the attention uh, and asking uh, medical universities, uh, health professional training uh, institutions to consider that uh, already in Europe, the population profile including the uh, immigrant uh, population, those uh, who are uh, still uh, under the evaluation, uh, whether uh, they may uh, receive the refugee status, their health assistance need special training. And currently, the majority uh, of the European uh, institutions, even on the field of uh, cultural competence, are not providing a solution for this very, very keen issue. I was uh, telling about uh, these facts uh, only uh, just to underline uh, the importance uh, of uh, this uh, today uh, webinar. And uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, again uh, for uh, Professor uh, Luciano Sasho uh, when uh, we were speaking uh, about uh, possible uh, further uh, topics. Uh, he was very much uh, open uh, and uh, integrated uh, in the series of that webinar, uh, this topic as well. So uh, what University of Page is currently uh, providing? Sorry, can I just um, uh, pause you there a second, Isvan? We are getting a bit short of time now. Could I ask you to speed up the next part of your presentation somewhat? Thank you. OK, uh, so. Uh, in the medical uh, training, uh, that uh, one semester, uh, uh, twelve week, uh, twenty four uh, classes uh, on uh, optional uh, topics, uh, basic principles of healthcare provision in the union, humanitarian assistance, uh, migration health and travel medicine, health status and healthcare of ethnic minorities. Uh, the, uh, also uh, topics uh, that are uh, not optional, but integrated uh, in uh, the regular training uh, in the primary health care and the occupational uh, health care uh, program. Uh, we have checked uh, students' uh, feedback, uh, how they have uh, valued uh, that uh, these topics uh, are integrated. Uh, here you can uh, see uh, that the absolute uh, majority uh, were uh, very much uh, satisfied uh, that uh, they met these topics uh, in the training. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, checked uh, separately uh, the occupational health uh, part of the uh, training. Uh, where uh, I would like uh, just uh, to repeat what uh, one of uh, the German students uh, told uh, that uh, now uh, he starts to understand uh, why German integration uh, policy is uh, not really uh, effective. So uh, we have also uh, postgraduate uh, courses uh, that is uh, specialist on migration health. That is a four semester uh, 120 uh, ECT value uh, training program uh, that was uh, developed uh, by a consortium we call CHANCE, uh, the University of East Anglia, then University, uh, 
cover your uh, Suffolk uh, University in Koshitsep, uh, Ensmoid uh, University, Geiswald, uh, and uh, the medicine were uh, participating, uh, and uh, as a result of uh, all of these uh, efforts, uh, University of Page Medical School uh, has uh, received. Uh, the uh, Erasmus Curriculum Development Partner uh, Institute uh, of uh, the European uh, Commission Erasmus uh, program, uh, and uh, we have uh, been uh, appointed uh, as a WHO uh, collaborating center for migration as uh, training uh, and uh, research, and. Uh, that's all what uh, I can uh, just uh, say as a conclusion. That's based on uh, all of those facts, uh, what we have heard uh, today, uh, I do hope uh, that uh, uh, in the training of the health professionals, uh, this aspect uh, will be uh, better incorporated in the future. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Isvan, for your uh, account of what's been uh, developed in, uh, in, in Pex University. And uh, we come now, last but not least, to our final speaker for today, uh, Alan Krasnick, who is in the Department of Public Health in the University of Copenhagen. Alan was a founder and director of the Danish Research Centre for Migration, Ethnicity and Health, and where he's now also a senior researcher. Alan's research and teaching have focused on healthcare policy and reforms, and on migrant, migrant and ethnic minority health and equity in access to and use of health services. So Alan, please give us your presentation. And um, can I just say, but as Alan does that, that if people in the audience have got questions, you can start putting them into chat, and we'll try to get some of them before we have to conclude. Thank you, Alan. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, for the introduction and for <clears throat> taking this subject on the list of, in the series of webinars, which is highly appreciated. <clears throat> I have the four main points in my short presentation. One is briefly, why is it important to include diversity uh, in, <clears throat> in the health educations? Uh, one is from cultural competency uh, to diversity competence, the movement from one concept to the next. What can we learn from a European project, Improdise, <clears throat> which is just uh, now almost completed, and uh, a few words about the process uh, forward. Um, uh, I just want to move on. Uh, just a moment, here we are. Why is it important to include diversity <clears throat> in health educations? We heard a lot about that already from other uh, speakers, but uh, just to summarize a few things, uh, the right to healthcare was mentioned, and uh, <clears throat> this is uh, clearly defined both uh, globally in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and but also in some of the national uh, healthcare acts, like the Danish Healthcare Act, and even the, <clears throat> the NHS Constitution for England, which calls for comprehensive services available to all. And besides uh, human rights issues, we know uh, that uh, health professionals all often feel more insecure in their ability to provide adequate care to migrant and ethnic minorities. We know that migrant and ethnic minority patients report lower levels of satisfaction in their encounters with the health system. <clears throat> we have clear evidence than uh, that migrants and ethnic minorities are more likely than majority patients to experience a patient safety event. And uh, <clears throat> we also know that patient complaints are most often due to communication errors. So there are <clears throat> many good reasons to uh, focus on this issue. Um, we heard <clears throat> also in the previous presentations uh, a lot about the different uh, concepts and how they are defined. And uh, Denise Spitzer mentioned uh, the uh, issue of, uh, of, of cookbook learnings from textbooks. And I actually have an example of how this has been 
<coughs> provided, even in a recent uh, nursing textbook, which explains that Muslims may not request pain medicine, but instead thank Allah for pain, that black people often report higher pain intensity than other cultures. They believe pain and suffering are inevitable and Jews may be vocal and demanding of assistance. So these kind of very stereotyped um, presentations of ethnic groups is really more damaging than helpful in development of cultural uh, competency and sensitivity. Uh, instead, many have started talking about diversity sensitivity as a concept that <clears throat> incorporates the cultural competences, but has a much broader uh, perspective uh, by having a focus on the recognition of different forms of diversity and also recognizing the issue of super diversity, which is diversity in diversity, diversity as normal realities <clears throat> and uh, which could be uh, explained by, uh, by, by this citation from Bertovic, whatever we choose to call it, there's much to be gained by a multi-dimensional perspective on diversity, both in terms of moving beyond the ethnic group as either the unit of analysis or sole object of studies, and by appreciating the coalescence of factors which condition people's lives. There are a, a lot of challenges and opportunities in medical education in order to promote this kind of uh, competences. And we heard <clears throat> already explanations about stereotypes, about intersectionality, about identity and about privilege, but also the issues of the hidden curriculum and teachers as role models should be taken into account. The hidden curriculum means that we should focus on what students learn rather than what we teach. So the hidden curriculum actually encompasses the culture of an institution, the interpersonal encounters, and what the students learn in a medical school outside what they are taught in the formal curriculum. And also the, the issue of teachers as role models that teachers' own identity determines the way they think and the way they teach. It defines the role model that they represent taught students and future medical doctors. And this has to be acknowledged <coughs> and taken into account in the whole uh, setup of uh, health uh, um, educations. So consciously we teach what we know, but unconsciously we teach who we are, and this is a reflection important to bring forward. Now, a few uh, results from uh, uh, ongoing European project, Improdise, which is a project in, uh, carried out in collaboration between several universities in Europe and, fund and funded by EIT Health, and which is about developing diversity sensitive medical curriculum by developing a course in diversity competence for medical teachers and training diversity competence for health professionals based on literature reviews, focus group interviews, a Delphi study and pilot courses. And the focus groups uh, interviews included students, teachers and practitioners and uh, it was a clear message from these uh, interviews that we need to focus on the whole program rather than only adding or repairing of specific elements. Uh, we need specific migrant health courses, but we also need to develop communication courses to include this kind of perspectives. And we need a general program integration. Uh, we also <clears throat> have been um, wiser by performing a Delphi panel um, study of including experts and researchers, uh, experts like researchers and health professionals from uh, different European countries, 31 all together, as you can see in this table. And I have some uh, prelim preliminary results from this 
study kindly provided by the leader of the project, uh, my colleague, Janne Sørensen. Six training elements have been categorized and defined in this uh, Delphi study, <clears throat> definitions and explanations of terms and concepts, information on specific uh, migrant and ethnic minority groups, knowledge about processes of migration, policies affecting health of the migrants and ethnic minorities and health care for these groups, discrimination and inequalities, and public health issues related to uh, migration. These are training elements that are required and should be included in health programs um, around the world. And the, uh, <clears throat> the experts um, were asked about <clears throat> what they think uh, is um, most important, uh, important, less important, or not important at all. And this table provides <clears throat> those issues that were given uh, the most consensus uh, in the group. Everybody agreed that health effects of migration <clears throat> is very important or important. Almost everybody agreed that forms of discrimination within the healthcare sector is important. Um, and also that national policies affecting health and healthcare of migrants and ethnic minorities is crucial. Human trafficking is an important element. Determinants of health disparities that should be included and also issues regarding the utilization of an access to healthcare and barriers for this kind of access. And furthermore, a number of topics was <clears throat> also given high priority. I'm not <clears throat> going to go through all of them, but just mention a few. Legal rights of migrants, according to migration, local policies affecting migrants, torture, living conditions, health-related risk factors, structural discrimination, etc., uh, was uh, agreed as important issues in this group of experts. But uh, <clears throat> topics and information and evidence is not sufficient. Reflections are even more important. And most important uh, kinds of reflection is about own stereotypes and prejudices, own fears and worries, own experiences and habits, roles and power relations, and discrimination in own workplace, whereas explanatory biological models <clears throat> is seen as much less important. And skills on communication and collaboration is crucial as well. And most important, uh, according to these experts, is to learn about the use of interpreters and to learn specific communication techniques, which are highly relevant for <clears throat> minority groups and migrants, but for everybody else as well. And regarding the methods for teaching, uh, priority should be given to videos about doctor-patient encounters, to case studies and exercise, and less to uh, issues like text and text links, multiple choice questions, exercises, portfolio questions, and short lectures. And what is the process forward to reach uh, these uh, uh, ideals in medical education? Well, first of all, schools need to realize that diversity sensitive medical training development involves the development of an orientation, a critical consciousness, uh, which places medicine in a social, cultural, and historical context, as we have heard in previous uh, presentations today. Uh, that uh, the development should reflect a philosophy that multiculturalism should be woven as an essential part into the curriculum rather than added on as a standalone course. And finally, that it involves the development of a professional and personal perspective with critical reflective awareness that incorporates the student's own values, worldview, and experiences. And the steps forward <clears throat> are many, and some of them are quite challenging. First, we need to teach the teachers. We need to assess course content and material. 
we need organizational involvement and responsibility in our educational institutions, but we also need training of healthcare managers in order to eliminate structural discrimination and facilitate inclusion of all patients. And finally, as has been outlined nicely also in previous presentations, adapting health policies and healthcare services accordingly. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking very much forward to uh, discussion and uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for this um, presentation. And uh, thanks again to all our speakers for their opening presentations. I think we've had a very uh, rich survey of uh, ideas, principles, backgrounds, and practices, and uh, um, a very good basis now for uh, a discussion. I'd like to um, open the discussion by asking you all, uh, all of our speakers, to briefly respond um, to a question which really has two related points to it, and it, it's something that uh, connects process and content. Um, I think uh, I think it's emerged very clearly from all these presentations and all the work that you've spoken about that um, there is uh, a need for and a massive significance of education about a very wide range of determinants of health, development of cultural competence, uh, understanding of diversity and so on. Uh, all of us who've ever worked in academic institutions know that they can sometimes be extremely resistant to fundamental changes in process and in curriculum, curriculum content. Uh, indeed, it's sometimes said that the curriculum can be like a graveyard full of dead bodies, but with lots of people, friends who are still alive. Um, and I'm sure that in trying to reform the education of health professionals in places that you work in and have worked in the past, you must have encountered a lot of resistance, um, especially when it comes to, uh, as we've heard again, very vividly described in a number of these uh, presentations today, especially when you're asking not just that the content of what you teach to students is changed, but the very way that the course thinks about itself, that people think about themselves, that both the instructors and the learners think about themselves needs to change as well. Um, and so part of my question is, uh, what experience have you got and what suggestions uh, have you got insights into how to achieve this kind of re-engineering of the places where the education takes place? Uh, but connected with that, one of the reasons that you often do find resistance to change in curriculums, um, to curricula, is that um, those resistant will say, well, this is newfangled stuff and it's not yet very well defined. And uh, are we sure that we know how to teach it and what it is we're teaching? Uh, and we have heard again today a very rich variety of talk about different models and moving on now from uh, cultural to intercultural, intersectionality, diversity approaches. Um, and a suggestion which I think came with one of our early speakers with Rena that perhaps uh, uh, we really do need to somehow systematize what this knowledge is and perhaps even begin to think about standardizing it in some ways, which is clearly very challenging when we're talking about the different life experiences of people in different parts of the world and the different uh, impacts that their own cultures and other people's cultures and so on have had on them. But is there potential for beginning to standardize and to have something that would be a globally recognized uh, and clear set of principles and practices that could be adapted, but more or less a universal guide? And would that, would that help or hinder the process of trying to mainstream all these ideas into the education of health professionals. And again, um, as has become clear and I mentioned in, in my introduction, it relates not just to the specific case of migrants and refugees, but it's really about all patients and all people that we're talking and therefore very worthwhile doing in principle. But uh, uh, let me throw that to each of you. Uh, uh, Rena, would you like to start on this one? Yes, uh, happy to do so. Well, I mean, uh, very. Uh, there's a lot of questions in uh, in what you have just said. Now, uh, I'll start with the uh, resistance. 
Um, for many years when I started looking at this and, and researching cultural competence and so forth, um, my colleagues used to say two main things. First of all, that we uh, teach nurses um, individualized care, how to do individual. And secondly, um, we don't have room in the curriculum. So the curriculum still remains very medically orientated. I mean, um, from the point of view of nurses, there is lots of co uh, uh, content, but is um, the, um, there is, uh, although they are adding new things, in my view, even in my university, there isn't, um, you know, the this uh, systematic thread that runs through the undergraduate curriculum, um, in in a way that I think it should be. Okay, so and I'm not in charge of the curriculum, but uh, so we need to really change the mindset of the those who. Um, who are in charge of curricula and curricular development of the importance of this issue. The, to me, it, it, go, it, it, it means, uh, you know, the fact that they can't find the space or they do something else, which actually requires the, you cannot teach individualized, uh, uh, provide individualized care and, and until you know about the person's uh, identity, cultural identity, ethnic identity, all the things that everybody was talking about, and also about the structural um, inequalities and and uh, that uh, come with it. So, um, you we they're not convinced that it is really so important. This is my uh, <laughs> This is my final kind. You know, uh, after thir over thirty years uh, trying and. Of course, we have done a lot of work, and we have done small courses and and and, and taught people uh, about different groups and whatever. But um, the there is there there's got to be some uh, pressure, I think, from the uh, from the regulators and and the regulating bodies to to come about for this to come about. I was in a in a in a uh, committee that looked at the European Union direct uh, directors for nursing recently, and there is nothing about that. And I kept saying, but well, but we can't really address that, and and all sorts of excuses for not really including it. Now, um, uh, the uh, what I'm going to have to ask you to be very short now because I want to get everybody in before we finish. Of course, of course, of course. I I want to say that um, uh, the uh, uh, I I agree with most of the things that have been said by everybody, and I, although I didn't have the time to present the um, the model properly. The model, actually, if you look at cultural awareness, people were talking about reflection. We do, ref we start with reflecting about our, our, our own values. We start with uh, looking at stereotypes. And I spent three years in, uh, in between to, to, uh, 2017 to 2020, actually uh, creating with artificial intelligence and uh, robotics people, a robot that is culturally competent. And the way that, you know, students don't need just knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. They need uh, skills and processes. They need to know how to, to ask questions, how to be sensitive and, and uh, to, to trot on the sensitive issues. And all of those kind of skills, you don't just read about them. You have to practice them as well. So the teachers have, to, the teachers, um, uh, are not really that informed. They just hear about something and they just take uh, some second and third um, and, and, and third hand uh, kind of information and have stereotypes about cultural competence or cultural diversity, whatever you want to call it. And, um, uh, and they tick a box, right? So um, it, this, is, this is why I think, you know, if we're going to have real change, and I do say, and if you if you saw on my on my presentation, cultural competence is good care for everybody because we look. Everybody is a cultural being. We all have. I'm a refugee myself. I have I have my own. I've been in in the UK for many many more years than I've been in my own country. So I have all the intersectionalities and all the all the complexities. But 
Um, so uh, uh, there isn't, you know, the pure English or whatever. We we are all made up of all sorts of things. So um, uh, it is it is a, an approach that is good for everybody. And 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 if we use it, we give quality uh, quality uh, to the care that we give. We give sensitivity, and we have less uh, complaints from the patients and the families because his, his communication is, is uh, really sure. important. Okay, th thank you. Uh, we, we are really running out of time. I'm going to take oh, the liberty of running five minutes over, and that means I'm going to give each of the rest of you one minute, to, okay. if you would like to say something, just to add to uh, Renner's very full account. Um, uh, Alan, you also talked about the need for practice in at the very end of your talk, uh, which echoes what Brenda's just said, this is a skill that can only be acquired through practice, not just through textbook learning. Yes, of course. And, uh, but I, I acknowledge, <clears throat> sorry, I acknowledge the barriers for introducing all these in the programs. <clears throat> sorry. And I think we need a bottom up as well as, as a top down uh, um, uh, approach. And we have to, to, to benefit from the fact that the students' health uh, medical students and students in health programs are di a diverse group themselves and yes. the teachers are challenged with the fact that they uh, have to sit in a diverse classroom and they have to communicate with diverse students. So I think we have to ally with the students that really need this kind of uh, development. We have to make alliance with the teachers that are frustrated by the fact that they have problems in uh, in, in getting uh, uh, their messages across. And we need national and international standards and guidelines as others mentioned as well. Yeah, in thank you. Um, Denise, in the very different context of Canada, um, do you see the same problems in your work or has it been uh, easier there to get these ideas across? Um, I think there are is as uh, individuals who are working on these things, but that we still don't have probably a systematic approach. And I just want to say that I really uh, concur with uh, Dr. Krasnick that I think uh, really there's a, a push from students uh, to ensure that the curriculum and their approach reflects not only their their population but the population of our countries. And and uh, there's. Uh, there is at least lip service given to the need for uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and indigenizing and decolonizing all of our work across uh, the universities and other institutions. And I think that uh, we can use that sort of rhetoric to try to actually make change uh, within our, our school systems. Yeah. And Istvan, uh, given the particular history of Hungary in recent years and in relation to migrant and refugee issues, uh, did you encounter a lot of resistance in setting up your programs? Are you muted? Muted. I think uh, it depends uh, on the openness uh, of the university leadership. Uh, so uh, even in Hungary, uh, our uh, university is a unique one, uh, dealing uh, so much and incorporating the regular uh, training, uh, this aspect. Uh, and uh, naturally, uh, with this, uh, we are uh, running on uh, international uh, scenarios uh, uh, and uh, we do not have uh, any conflict uh, on that. Uh, but uh, just uh, one issue, uh, I would like to go back uh, to your uh, initial questions. Uh, WHO have uh, just recently uh, uh, finished uh, a study uh, putting uh, together competencies for the training uh, of uh, health professionals uh, in uh, refugee uh, assistance. In most of the clinical subjects, uh, they are internationally standardized uh, and uh, accepted uh, competencies. Uh, what uh, somebody uh, who is uh, receiving a, a medical diploma uh, should be aware about. 
uh, I think, and uh, Alan uh, project uh, is, uh, as far as uh, I understood, is going into this uh, uh, direction, uh, it would be uh, advisable. Uh, to put together uh, for the regular medical and health professional training, those list of competencies what are related uh, to this uh, subject as uh, Reina has uh, uh, explained it is. So that is uh, my comment and uh, advice for the future. Thank, thank you, Sven. And uh, Michael, any particular reflections on this one very briefly? Yeah, thank you. I have some very brief reflections also. So first of all, I agree with Ellen on the bottom up and uh, top down approach. I think we have to be strategic with students and also from, from, from top down with standards and there are standards. I think we, can, we talked about human rights and we have a strong human rights framework internationally and the human right to health is very strong. So we have standards. We have also science, scholarly discussions. We have standards defined uh, on several levels so we can work on this. But I think strategically it makes sense to uh, and we stressed this previously, not to see this migration and health as kind of some adding something to the curriculum, but to look for the synergies with social medicine, with, with ethics, with many different uh, aspects in the curriculum, which are strong in the curriculum, especially now in the post-pandemic phase. We have to think about the social dimension, social inequities and social determinants of health and their migration and mobility is part of it. And in addition, I think we should also think about different levels of, of doing this. We probably have to define some content that we think is needed for all health professionals, other for people in specific disciplines, with specific interest in gynecology, for example, on FGM, in mental health, on trauma issues and migration and so on, to be kind of specific at the different levels and different parts of the curriculum. And then something like a master's course, like in PESH for people who really want to work in migration health. So we have to be also there kind of uh, thinking about different, yes, strategies. And I think, and then we have to do this together <laughs> and move this together. And this seminar, this webinar and the series is a very important step in this. So thank you very much for sharing this, for organizing this and, and for all this brilliant uh, contributions and the discussion, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, that sounds like a very good note to start to bring this to a conclusion. And uh, I'm pleased was pleased to see that a few minutes into our webinar, um, Luciano Sasso was able to join us and uh, has been there throughout. So, Luciano, I think I'm going to give you the final word as you weren't here at the beginning. Yes. Uh, no. Thank you very much. It will be very short. Uh, just to thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, for sharing so well uh, this webinar. Uh, many thanks to all the speakers. I think this was a great uh, webinar uh, organized by DMH Alliance together with Unica. I think uh, it was a good idea to do that uh, because of the experience, of course, of the DMH Alliance in this uh, theme of uh, migrant and refugee health. Uh, you know, as you know, we organized many other events before and we are planning other sessions uh, in the near future, including an important session at the World Health Summit on the 25th of October. I hope that some of you will be able to attend that session. And also Unica has a huge experience in education uh, with a working group EduLab, uh, which was created about 20 years ago. So what has been discussed today is very relevant, I think, for both the networks. So again, uh, thank you very much uh, to, to you, Stephen, to all the speakers, to all the participants to the organizers, uh, especially in this case, uh, Leah Goodman for helping us for the logistics and uh, Nora Anton. So again, uh, um, we hope to see you soon uh, again on the screen of the MH Alliance and Unica. So thank you all again, everybody. Thanks to all our speakers and to all our audience for staying with us and uh, um, have a good rest of the day, everybody, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.